आई वी एम वेलकम टू ऑल थिंग्स पॉलिसी अ डेली पॉडकास्ट बाय द तक्षशिला इंस्टीट्यूशन वी आर अ बंच ऑफ पॉलिसी नर्ड्स बेस्ड इन बेंगलुरु एंड वी लाइक ब्रिंगिंग फ्रेश पर्सपेक्टिव्स टू इंडियन अफेयर्स एंड इंडियन पर्सपेक्टिव्स टू ग्लोबल अफेयर्स सो ग्रैब अ कप ऑफ कॉफी सिट बैक एंड जॉइन अस फॉर टुडेस चैट हेलो एंड वेलकम टू ऑल थिंग्स पॉलिसी आई एम मनोज केवल रमानी एंड टुडे आई हैव विद मी माय कोलीग प्रतीक वाघरे and we're going to be talking about social media activity influence operations coordinated behavior by malign actors so that's going to be a conversation based on some of the work that pratik has done in his newsletter which i highly recommend everybody to read and we'll be uh, linking the newsletter in the show notes but just before we begin this conversation let me just tell you that all things policy is a weekday podcast uh, on public policy and it is a pragati initiative with that pratik welcome to the conversation thanks much So let's just get right into it right in your latest newsletter you talk about this May 2021 coordinated inauthentic behavior report by Facebook and it talks about a specific network from Pakistan which targets domestic audiences also global audiences content in English Arabic and Pashto so tell us a little bit about what this network does and has done and why is it an important sort of take into what's going on in the world of sort of misinformation influence operation Yeah sure so uh, facebook puts out these monthly reports right of uh, the action that they've taken to identify what, what they call as coordinated inauthentic behavior right and uh, the latest edition had three networks and one of them was as you said a network that they said originated in pakistan right they attributed it to essentially a public relations agency in pakistan so it, i think they pointed to note that they have it made any attribution to any state actor uh, or anything of the, of that sort right and the way this network operated it, i think it built around a following of 8000 people or 8000 accounts right across different assets right which is i believe it had around 40 accounts on facebook 25 pages on facebook a number of groups i think six groups and about uh, 28 instagram accounts which had another 2400 uh, followers right and it focused mainly on six kinds of narratives there was you know the one about being proud of pakistan there was unsurprisingly an anti india angle to it as well support for imran khan right uh, and general content against enemies of the state or traitors stuff about the uh, military and interestingly i think one that uh, seemed to you know not align with the rest of the was uh, around chinese investment in the cpec corridor right and they relied on you know various types of pages etc to put these different types of narratives across right this it's also interesting because i want to contrast this to another investigation that was uh, put out by dfr lab Uh, recently and this concerns something from india right and they attributed again it was attributed to public relations agency based in canada which also appears to have some connection with which is contracted to work with uh, the indian ministry of external affairs or at least was contracted at one point it's unclear what the current status is uh, and it looks like they were doing this independent operation which they were calling india versus disinformation and it was meant to counter narratives against india right that was the that was the stated purpose and in that case it got very little engagement so as per the investigation that they put out i think a lot of their posts got maybe one like or something on twitter uh, and and facebook etc but it was notable that it also got some amount of engagement from various handles that belong to various indian missions in different countries right? and and the reason i'm contrasting that is because they to they seem to represent two very different ends of the spectrum right one seems to be a very targeted focused type of activity although we don't know what the impact of that was while the other seem to be more a bottom up by you're trying to go out and get various trying to target a general public or general audience on facebook it's interesting to contrast those two and see and then that raises the question of you know how effective uh, they actually are this is interesting i mean one of the things that again i sort of found fascinating was like you just said you know the idea of how some of the operations are becoming you know and how different groups based on what their objective is will move from sort of targeting like you've written wholesale to retail sort of you know operations and where you're becoming far more careful about whom you select why you select somebody and then how to sort of go about delivering that message the idea here is about essentially and i presume some of this has come because there has been assessments also about the effectiveness of these campaigns by these actors themselves um, just like any other sort of advertising or pr agency which wants to influence uh, your buying decisions for a product 
you look at the message you look at the targeting and you will then sort of adapt and it seems like that's something that's going on here also where you know people are looking at their messaging people are looking at the targeting and they're adapting and that's to me that's fascinating how that's taking place in sort of real time um what's like you also mentioned about right uh, effectiveness the challenge of course in all of this is how do you assess what is effectiveness and i think in some ways uh, i mean i'll let you talk about this first uh in terms of how does one affect uh, how do these reports and how do analysts who are talking about this discuss effectiveness and then i'll get into my other question and i should clarify right? i think the phrase wholesale to retail is uh, not something that i came up with it's something that facebook used uh, in a recent report that they did on state of influence operation uh, and they identified a number of trends uh, one of which was that there is this move from uh, wholesale to to retail or more targeted kind of uh, influence operation yeah and, and so, so coming to the effectiveness question right? and i think that's it's it's a very interesting question and there's no answer to that yet right on on the one hand that you, you have to make an initial judgment of what the aim of the operation was right which is let's be honest we're always guessing right we never really know uh, but you know as, as you alluded to there is this that comes in because it it has similarities with uh, what you do with digital marketing etc and brand right where you're trying to get a message across and trying to convince people right and in, so in this book in the book hype machine right uh, sunil narayan talks about this concept of lift Uh, which is essentially a which tries to measure a change in behavior right and he gives a very interesting example to demonstrate that which is that let's say you know a, a professor standing outside a lecture hall if he's handing out flyers about that particular topic or that particular lecture to everyone walking in and then he says okay uh, what is the conversion rate of that of that flyer right and in this case you look at conversion rate as people who saw that flyer received that flyer who turned up for that class which is 100% right because he handed them to to people as they were walking in but then the question is how much behavioral change did that message create right uh, in this case you can potentially say 0% because if they were at the door they were going to walk in anyway so you don't really know uh, how much behavioral so you, so you can you can say that you comfortably say that the behavioral change was was zero but that is the point that gets tricky to assess in in the context of these influence operation right you don't know so you first you're working in an environment where you're guessing what the intention was right uh, and then to go a step further you're trying to then judge outcomes based and you're trying to establish a causality there right as opposed to just correlation and that's where it gets uh, it gets little tricky but the situation you have today is that because of this i guess void or gap right in terms of how do we assess them there's a risk or there's a tendency to then start looking at the wrong set of metrics right uh, and we saw this you know very prominently with uh, the russian ira operations to your targeted around the 2016 election in the us right so you had a lot of these hearings uh, that were talking about oh you know it had x million likes on facebook and y million followers and this many millions of interactions but we don't really know how much of those messages went to people who were, were already predisposed to that sort of messaging uh, versus how much behavioral change it caused right so that behavioral change is hard enough to measure in a pure digital marketing or a commerce context because you don't know whether someone who once clicked on an ad 6 months later bought a product because of just because he saw that ad 6 months ago or because he or she saw that ad 6 months ago or some other reason right it's even harder for things like political opinion and voting uh, voting behavior right because there are so many factors that individuals take into account when they make that decision so it's really hard to attribute that to uh, a message that they might have once seen on facebook and that's where so we have a sense of you know i, I don't think we have a sense of what to look for but there is growing consensus on what we should not measure this as right and that's still a step forward yeah i mean this is fascinating right now and i'm going to say certain things which might be a little bit controversial but in a lot of when we discuss this measuring the outcome often we are like you said right you know we are looking at measuring eventual impact on behavior of the target and that's one i think that measure that we are assuming particularly when it comes to sort of influence operations which have in some way state backing if not entirely driven by the state uh, you know so for example if it is say uh, i think i cover china i'll talk about that if it is chinese media narratives or it is you know chinese diplomats or you know chinese users who are engaged in sort of on twitter or facebook engaged in sort of coordinated activity uh, or likewise the russian we tend to sort of look at assessing outcomes based on what we believe is effectiveness of behavior change and the example of it was obviously the biggest thing was when look at the us election in 2016 and people spoke about how you know this coordinated activity led to people believing certain things and then eventually potentially voting in certain ways or not voting i think we also need to look at institutional objectives because obviously particularly in government and bureaucracies 
often output is the outcome you know the idea that x number of things have been created the fact that uh, and something as intangible sometimes as you know we engaged in x kind of discourse on these platforms which challenged a particular narrative that in itself regardless of whether that narrative got you know so many people to change their behavior is seen as success in itself i mean i can talk about my time working in china with state media there was tremendous effort each week to gather data about likes location where these likes were coming from retweet what kind of demographics of people were using you know were accessing were subscribing to the platforms of the organization it, and it was like any other sort of you know digital marketing output would outfit would eventually work but the objective was to present those outputs as outcome um, rather than trying to assess like you said and it's very challenging to assess how behavior gets changed or whether it gets changed or not uh, and that requires tremendous qualitative work over a period of time along with actually tracking people's activities at the end of the day or maybe you know at most maybe tracking somebody's opinions over time on social media and see whether they've changed or not so that's one sort of way where output is equal to outcome another way that i've sort of noticed um, and this is again very particular to how the chinese have done things is that they have engaged in very competitive sort of discourse contestation at the end of which the objective is that when you discuss something your certainty about it reduces so you know somebody who was otherwise have freely sort of said yes what's happening in xinjiang is deeply problematic uh, and may be borders on genocide or whatever you know somebody who might have subscribed to that view softens their position to stop using the word genocide stop using certain kinds of language criticizes it in a much more sort of you know there's greater prevarication in what you're doing and that in itself can be seen as success now critics will call it that oh you ended up self censoring yourself some people will say no but that's sort of till you don't have evidence there is a certain political correctness and all of that uh, and you don't have sufficient evidence or whatever and so you know so you end up getting so to be able to capture those people who are probably some with undecided or even decided in a certain direction but to soften the language the tone the tenor of criticism by pushing back on the discourse is to me it's sort of another way of assessing whether particular operation has been successful or not what you said earlier right about uh, measuring this as looking at output as outcome right that that reminds me a little bit of what uh, thomas reid wrote, wrote about an active measure right which is basically saying that in this context active measures is specifically for, you know for this foreign information uh, foreign influence operation kind of scenario right and he says that over time they've become uh, more active and less measured <laughs> in the sense that you have more operations happening but it's become that much harder now to determine right the the effectiveness of them and you know which then goes into i think what you said about looking at different ways to sort of gauge their effectiveness uh, even from the actors themselves right not just from the targets but even from the actors themselves and he, he, there is an important point about this right he says that these actors themselves are not immune to being disinformed by their own operation right either overstating the effects that overstating the impact that they might have had you know, the second point that, that you raised about the tone changes right or just changing the i guess to some extent the tone of the debate that's a very interesting one and again yeah, and you know I, i i don't think i don't know if we'll ever be able to measure something of that sort right that's going to be extremely difficult and and i sort of agree with you right uh, even getting that change can be considered a significant shift right uh, from moving moving a person from you know unequivocally condemning something to a more measured take on it right is behavioral change right but i don't know how you'd go about measuring that yeah i mean that's really tricky and that you know i mean you can see examples of that in uh, in india also right where say debates on caste uh, and some of it's helpful right you know violent vitriolic debate doesn't help anybody uh, so if people become more measured it becomes a little bit better also but in some cases where you know there may be significant evidence to suggest something and the sort of and you sort of then tone down the rhetoric because you've competed quite vigorously against it uh, and people you know and the fact is that look nobody really knows everything uh, you have a certain position based on what your understanding is uh, and when you're challenged with a position based on evidence it's fair to sort of reassess it but when you're challenged based on evidence which is held maybe shoddy or you know vitriol or you know ostracization you end up sort of toning down a little bit and that in itself is a success of the particular operation but yeah, i agree with you i don't know how one would measure that so let me then pose this to you how are platforms dealing with some of this stuff what are the different things that they are doing so facebook put out this report it said that it's you know this is particular one particular case study that that's in the report but how are platforms in general trying to approach 
uh, influence operations? Has it evolved? I mean, I'm sure it's evolved much more since 2016, but what are the sort of trends that you're seeing right now? Yeah, so it's a, so you mentioned this, uh, the, the Facebook report, and I'll, I'll go back to first that state of influence operations report that they said, and you know, one of the trends that we discussed was shift from wholesale to retail targeted operations. The other trends that they identified were, and some of this we just touched upon, right, was the, a blurring of lines between your authentic public debate and public conversation and discourse uh, and manipulation. Right. So by either co-opting actors uh, into these operations, right, uh, or perception hacking, which is capitalizing on you know an overstated fear of uh, these influence operations, right? uh, which I thought was uh, was interesting, and, and I think to a large extent a lot of this was in the context of, of the U.S. But you can sort of see how that plays, right? Uh, and the other two things that they said were influence operations as a service, right? Which again we're seeing a lot of PR agencies do this. There is it, it's actually being called black PR, right? Where you're using this for, you're using the same techniques that you use to get a message across about brands to these more politically motivated messages and better operational security, even on the parts of these these various networks, right? They're getting, they're getting better at covering their tracks and generally staying undetected, right? So it's, it's an escalation on that front, right? Now, coming to platforms themselves, there is this partnership for countering influence operations. Right? This is an initiative taken by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, they sort of they've been looking at this question, uh, and they've put out two, I guess, analyses based on one how platforms approach them uh, in their community standards, and two with the type of interventions uh, that they're taking. Right, and it's it's interesting. So on the community standards approach, uh, there's they broadly identify two types of model. One is a generalized model to approach this, which is that, you know, it's based on very loose standards which require judgment. So you're not being very specific uh, about how you define certain actions, etc. Right. Uh, and the advantage of this is that it gives the platform a lot of flexibility. Right. Uh, they, there is, they can apply subjective analysis in different contexts. And of course, they're easier to, they, it's easier to write something like this, right, as opposed to, to the particularized uh, approach, which is uh, based on you know many specific rules uh, and rule sets, and you have a set of conditions and outcomes uh, that you define. Right now, while this seems to be uh, from a user perspective, it's more transparent, more predictable. It is something that you know you need a lot of resources uh, resources to do. Right, and the other thing that they've done is interestingly, uh, there is so the term influence operation is itself very contested. Right, there are different uh, definitions for it and then you overlap with disinformation misinformation warfare etc so there is that confusion that's in there so one of the things that they've done is that they've broken it down right into different types of behavior right so you have spam as one you have coordinated behavior as another uh, or you uh, or you look at you know threat, threats of violence right so they've broken it down into these subcategories rather than trying to deal with it as you know disinformation in general or uh, influence operations in general. A good example of this is right. Like if you go on Twitter, there is actually no way to report a particular tweet for misinformation. Right, uh, that option doesn't exist. Right? Uh, or even COVID nineteen misinformation. And to a large extent, that's by design. Right, uh, they, they are trying to break this down into uh, into different categories where it's potentially easier to frame rules. Right, and they, and they also identified a framework uh, of these policies, which is uh, essentially the A B C D E framework. Uh, which is looking at actors, behaviors, content, distribution, and effects. And it's interesting because, you know, for all the conversation there is around actors, uh, that those were put you know, among the least, I guess, you know, to an extent, the, the actors were the, the subject of the policies in the, in the least number of cases, right? The policies typically favored, typically focused on behavior in, in most cases and to some extent, and, you know, the next highest was content, right? Things like actors and distribution were lower down in the order. Uh, effects is also, you know, we, we've seen now a lot more focus on effect, especially after the Jan 6 insurrection thing, right? There is, uh, now platforms have started taking effect more seriously and to some extent also with COVID-19, but that's not yet reflected, you know, completely in terms of the subject of their policy, although they're using that as a framework to say, okay, this is when we will intervene, right? Uh, but I think that uh, that shift is happening in their public stance it's not yet taken effect it doesn't seem to have taken effect at least in terms of how often they refer to it in their uh, uh, in their community standard then you go into okay how are they responding right what types of things they're doing uh, so th so this this was another analysis that they did and the interesting thing is so 
uh, I think since 2016, there have been 92 dif- 90 odd announcements, 92 announcements that uh, platforms have made saying, okay, we've done this to counter so and so influence operation or so and so uh, situation, right? Uh, out of which 83 have come in 2019 and 2020, right? So, so you can see that there is this shift towards announcing things. There's two so two aspects, right? One is they're pushed into action. Uh, and you know, for the sake of for the sake of public perception and transparency, they also they are also talking a lot more about the kind of actions they are taking. Interestingly, most of them are in the typically just user interface type of intervention, right? They're not. There have yet been no changes to uh, how platforms actually work uh, in in a lot of these cases, right? Because so you find a lot of debate saying that look, the mod the problem is the model that it seeks attention. Uh, etc cetera, etc cetera, right so there have you know none of the interventions so far have gone that direction uh, to a large extent it's mainly things like redirecting you to authoritative authoritative sources of information uh, and and labeling right uh, and what's what stood out to me was this was, was this right that uh, i think in under 10% of the cases these announcements actually came with an assessment of how effective they would be right and that i found was interesting right because before rolling it out that doesn't seem to be you know at least a publicly stated a position on how effective they expect them to be at least in terms of quantifying right uh, now i think this analysis did not take into account uh, assessment that they put out you know after the fact or later but it's still it's still notable that when the first mass when the mass rollout is taking place uh, we don't really know what to expect right for for a lot of these interventions as we start seeing more and more of them Uh, and different types of them across different platforms we're still guessing in terms of you know how much of an impact they'll actually they'll actually have this is fascinating you know in terms of how this space is evolving and how you know like like you said right you know they most platforms have tried to i'm sure they've tried to but they've also tried to showcase that they are doing much more in this regard uh, and i guess that is the trend and it's also obviously leading them into confrontation with different uh, governments at different places i mean india is an example where there has been tremendous confrontation between twitter and government of india um at the last question that i had for you was in the context of uh, something that i read in your news letter where you know the point that essentially no debate no conversation today is an internal affair uh, and that to me is again striking because uh, it it goes to many places right because the idea that sovereignty over internal affairs uh you know state sovereignty over internal affairs is a key sort of component of international relations and the global order um and you can see that over the last three decades there has been this push and pull with regard to this principle of sovereignty and non interference in inter- internal affairs and the idea that sort of in the 90s you had this idea of you know humanitarian intervention then right to protect um and today we are seeing this friction play out between different entities india also and different countries and the chinese and the russians with regard to internal affairs and platforms are allowing this discussion to take place and i'm just curious because the way the way things are going how do you sort of assess this dynamic play out i mean i i feel i fear that increasingly as these conversations become more prominent governments will have greater incentive to crack down on platforms and therefore you will probably see much more Uh, clamp down uh, you know and you see this contestation between private entities the platforms and governments but also between different uh, groups within states where they will want action uh, which will then eventually impact uh, free speech and i'm curious also as to what this does to the larger idea of states having sovereignty over internal affairs you know just any thoughts on that or was it or was it just a too <laughs> scattered a thought Yeah, I, th- I think there's, there's different aspects there, right? One is, yeah, I, I think this this question of you know the way information flows, there is no internal, there are no internal affairs, right? Uh, I think that, and and we've been seeing that, right? It, I don't think it's necessarily a new insight that uh, we we've seen it unfolding and it's accelerated uh, with you know with with social media, right? Uh, you know the the point about clampdown, right? and I think we're already seeing that, right? To a large, if you, if you look at, for example. uh you know various countries are passing more and more uh, stringent laws to to regulate social media right or to regulate speech on social media platforms i think that is certainly happening right uh, and you can see that because for example you know movements in countries now get so much more attention uh, than they would have otherwise right uh, if if you take for example the the farmer protests uh, in india right the, the type of international attention uh, that they got right it, it so states will fear can fear potentially more scrutiny right uh, to when these sort of uh, when these sort of things happen 
uh, which you know, on in the on the one hand can lead them to you know to try and clamp down more there, there's another aspect to this right uh, which and this comes from my from my pessimistic view is that look this you know what's happening is that there is there is a flattening of these responses right so if if you if you look at this year right we've had so many of uh, uh, these things that you know i guess uh, maybe an in, in, an international coalition has sort of uh, coalesced around right it started off with the it it, it had the the farmer protests right uh, if then if you look at uh, what happening with with in palestine right uh, you have a, a lot of people coming together to 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 express support for that my fear is that over time right uh, how many of these can you pay attention to right uh, because i i think the unfortunate reality of the world is that things like this keep happening in various countries right uh, as as an international community how many of these can you uh, pay attention to uh, and actually potentially it goes back to even black lives matter right even that got a significant amount of international uh, international interest uh, last year right uh, so so there is there is that aspect right so on on the one hand you know states can states will be worried about more scrutiny i'm also curious to see how this plays out four or five years down the road you know if, if will will there be a flattening of attention that these that uh, various kind of causes uh, causes get right and couple that in with in an environment where states are trying to enforce more control right uh, o- over over these information flows so it it you know i, I don't have answer on how that will play out uh, but i think that's something to to, to watch out for right uh, because yeah you know because because of the global information flows and the fact that we have limited attention that we can give to uh, to various causes it it's you know it, so there's that aspect and, and and the other other hand is it also creates complications for you know this whole broader concept of influence cooperation and uh, information flows being global it creates complications for i guess to large extent to you know anyone who's a domestic opponent right or in that context because uh, you don't know with the, when the message you put out is misused or appropriated by someone with a different completely different objective right you could be saying something because you want you genuinely want better governance uh, in the country right a foreign adversary may pick up those same talking points uh, and do something do something different with it and then this is one of the points that uh, facebook said right that there is a blurring of lines between authentic public debate and public discourse uh, and manipulation right so then how as a domestic actor do you uh, not let your voice get Uh, appropriated by uh, these actors because the other thing that happens with that is it your other domestic opponents will use that to delegitimize you right saying that hey you're you, you're speaking the same language as as the enemy right and that is another challenge that you know we we have that i think domestic politics in general is going to face right we typically look at it from the angle of states and saying that okay you know dissent will flow across uh, but i think there's also this angle of you know how do domestic opponents handle their own talking points and their own views being appropriated and misused and then as a result of that them being uh, further delegitimized uh, in yeah yeah look that's that's fascinating that right? i mean the idea of how something that you and i i think we've seen this uh, in india where something said in the us gets used in the domestic debate in india and it may not even be about india but it gets used in like where that we've seen this in uh, the chinese context where they like you said the black lives matter discourse in the us got sort of transplanted uh, in as part of chinese domestic propaganda with regard to you know their system superiority uh, equality ethnic policy human rights everything uh, and the narrative over there but that, that's fascinating this sort of blurring of lines is again we live in interesting times which uh, can be a curse or a boon depending on how you look at it but yeah this has been a fascinating conversation thank you so much prateek thanks so much Hey folks keep listening to all things policy like i said we are a weekday public policy podcast and we are powered by privacy do tune into the next episode thank you if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can tune into them on the ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram.
I'd like to thank the sponsor of the network this week, Cred and Sia. Thank you so much for making this possible. On Cyrus Says, Cyrus was joined by actress Shia Pilgalkar to talk about her career in acting. On Begin the Journey, Ashish Vidyarthi lists down the modern concepts of friendship and how one can choose the right friend circle in life on Begin the Journey. On The Habit Coach, Ashton Doctor was joined by Aisha Bilamoria to talk about running and developing an athletic mentality. Farhad and Sunetra are joined by LGBTQ workplace advocate Suresh Ramdas to discuss the new normal in queer relationships on GBCD. On Tere Mide Raste, Keshav Chaturvedi takes us to the riverbanks of Banaras and describes the soulful mornings to us. And finally, on the Positively Unlimited podcast, Chetna Chakravarti takes the fear of the word responsibility. And with that, I hope to see you again next week. If you love cricket, listen up. The Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast is here for you. Hosted by DJ, Varun and me, Ashwin, we bring a fun, fresh fan's point of view to talking all things cricket. Sometimes it's just the three of us, sometimes we have guests, including current and former international cricketers. For new episodes every week, check out the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast on the IBM app, website or wherever you get your podcasts.